Okay, where are we? Excellent. Okay, great. So this panel, our three o'clock panel, is monitoring invasive species infestations and vectors. And um, on our panel, we have Lee Greenwood. She is the Forest Health Pest, oh, sorry, Forest Health Program Director of the Nature Conservancy. Oops, going on to page two. Erin Rainey, Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator with Arizona Game and Fish Department. And Christy Martin, the Program Manager and Public Information Officer of University of Hawaii. And bear with me here on all these acronyms, but I really feel we need to get them spelled out. So the University of Hawaii Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species. So this group is going to focus on monitoring the spread of invasive species by focusing on crucial vectors as a major component of invasive species control pro programs. And Lee, if you could kick us off. Thanks very much, Leah. So my name's Lee Greenwood. I'm the Forest Health Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. And what that means is that I work on all sorts of different forest health related invasive species issues in forests and trees throughout. North America. That includes a focus on major pathways such as firewood, uh, the international imports of materials and the things they are transported on, as well as the breeding and resistance research for trees that are imperiled by invasive species. Let me see if I can get this right on the first try. Oh yeah. So early detection and rapid response is the theme of this group. And you know, early detection and rapid response is thought of to only be helpful if the detection itself can lead to a rapid response and an effective response. And of course, some invaders have effective rapid response possibilities and tools. This is a tree that's been attacked by the Asian longhorn beetle, which is a species that does have effective rapid response tools. But as a management community, we also need to mitigate harm for species that don't have adequate tools in the scientific toolbox for rapid eradication-based responses, so we have to go to a different model. And I, the reason I bring up Asian longhorn beetle is because it's a great poster pest, but we have lots of other pests, including some pests with a little bit more difficult models, such as the European and Asian gypsy moth, that's an Asian gypsy moth right there, and the emerald ash borer. Now, because of these guys being established in one part of the continent and not in the other, the response to any kind of a detection in the western United States is going to be intrinsically different than if it wasn't established in North America in the first place. So we have to address the pathways for internal spread within North America as well as additional introductions from uh, international sources. So I love to show this cheesy supply chain thing that I pulled off of the DHL website because it's actually really helpful to think about the complexity of the path pathways involved. And that's a picture, I believe, of the Port of Savannah that I took last year. Um, so you have these origin warehouses where pests can be either introduced into the packing container or the goods themselves. Then you have the conveyances, such as the ships and the containers and the pallets that they're in during that international transport phase. Customs and Border Protection will intercept a lot of stuff. So that's that early detection through the international shipment pathway, but some things get through, so then you have to go to the next part of the pathway, the warehouse part. And the Nature Conservancy right now is working on some initiatives in order to facilitate better detection in warehouse environments because that's a really important part of the pathway. You notice I haven't even mentioned any names of pests in this section because all of these parts of the supply chain are not addressed on a pest-by-pest -pest basis largely. They're, they're addressed according to the actual behaviors of the pest. So does this do, is it a group of pests that stick to something else? Or is it a group of pests that are found inside of wood? So those pathway-based responses are not necessarily related to the species themselves. Uh, here is a pallet. Shortly after I was explaining this to somebody in a warehouse during a visit, that they said, oh, no, we've never seen insects and diseases on pallets. And this was literally standing right next to us. Those are um, very large insect damage marks. Now, of course, this wood could have been properly treated. Those could have been harmless. But it does underscore the point that pallets can be a major pathway for forest pests and pathogens. And once they're established in the United States, sometimes firewood becomes a really dominant pathway. And firewood is particularly difficult because it cannot be right now 
led, uh, regulated from a commodity standpoint due to the different ways that the legal rules around regulations work, it has to be regulated on a pest by pest basis. That's really tough for a pathway. These terrible looking fungally infested holes in this piece of this pile of firewood are from polyphagous shot hole borer, which is a uh, insect disease complex that's causing millions of dollars of damage in Southern California right now, completely unregulated, spreading pretty rapidly. One of the biggest ways that it moves is on contaminated firewood, like this stack seen here. This particular pest is from Southeast Asia, so it is climate limited within the United States to the Southern tier, but you can imagine from Southern California to say Florida is an enormous potential pathway for the movement of this and any other pest found in Southern California. Uh, and to underscore that it's not just little bugs, one of my colleagues actually sent me this picture last week. He was splitting firewood and he got so excited and he sent me a cell phone photo. When you work in forest pests and pathogens, you expect these photos all the time. <laughs> he doesn't know what that is. I don't know what that is, but it's awesome. <laughs> so the biggest issue that we have right now uh, is the emerald ash borer and the considerations that we as a community are putting into whether or not the federal regulation on emerald ash borer and the movement of firewood and nursery stock continues to be appropriate. And the Nature Conservancy just submitted comment on Friday. It was published um, out onto regulations.gov yesterday on this topic, so I encourage you all to read it. But one thing to consider is whether or not those regulations, even though emerald ash borer doesn't have a really great response mechanism for eradication at this time, are they appropriate to mitigate the spread of emerald ash borer in the western United States and also parts of the southern United States that are currently not infested. And some of the things that you might want to consider in that you know, decision is that 73% of the U.S. native range of, emerald, of ash trees in the U.S., let alone in Canada and Mexico, are currently uninfested. 41%, according to 2010 census data, so a little bit off, of the U.S. population is currently protected by the federal quarantine from economic and health impacts of death of all of the ash trees in their communities. And 14 of the 20 North American Fraxinus, which is ash, uh, trees species within the genus are currently uninfested. Five out of the six that are infested are now listed as threatened by the red list held by IUCN, and I don't remember what the acronym IUCN stands for. So this is the map, and I think it's a good map to kind of meditate on for a moment because if you look into the western United States, you'll see that in Montana, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, those squiggly shapes of the native range of ash are the river basins. That's the moisture soil of that space. And that's one of the reasons that we partner in pathway management with fish, wildlife, and parks and similar agencies throughout the west in order to distribute uh, don't move firewood-based educational materials at boat uh, inspection stations. And we do that in Montana and Colorado. I believe they also do it in Idaho, but I wasn't able to make sure of that before this talk. Um, and that's a really important thing because one of the biggest movers of firewood are boat owners and RV owners and long distance uh, travelers for recreation. And those are the people going to those rivers with their boats to those squiggly lines that represent the uh, moist soil habitat of ash trees in the western states. I feel like it's really awesome that Governor Bullock called out Bryce for wearing the bug costume because when I made this presentation I debated should I put a picture of Bryce in my bug costume, Gary Adams in my bug costume, or me in my bug costume. And in the end I decided to embarrass myself in front of all of you. Um, but I wanted to make sure also that, you, that I mentioned the importance of partnership and funding. Um, we receive funding for all of our pathway-based mitigation efforts from these three major federal partners, APHIS, uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine Group, the U.S. Forest Service through their international programs, and the U.S. Forest Service through state and private health, forest health protection, which is one of the many parts of state and private health. That's a state and private forestry, that's a huge department. So thanks very much. I'll look forward to the questions phase later. Great. Thank you, Lee. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Erin Rainey with Arizona Game and Fish Department. Let's see. We can, um, pause. We'll see. I had some slides. We'll see. There we go. All right. Um, 
So for uh, aquatic invasive species programs, uh, inland anyways, we definitely focus uh, our management on recreational boating as the largest vector for transporting aquatic invasive species to inland waters. Um, after the discovery of quagga mussels in Lake Mead, uh, the Western states had this monumental task of forming AIS programs and creating protocols and programs to protect uninfested water bodies and watersheds and contain um, infestations. Uh, so one tool that has emerged um, to help us manage recreational boating as a region uh, is this regional watercraft inspection and decontamination data sharing system. So the history of this is um, it was actually developed by Colorado Parks and Wildlife and it was initially just built as a way to expedite data entry for inspectors in Colorado, um, just to log inspections, location, what procedures were done. Um, so for example, if a decontamination was performed and it had the benefit of reduction of error due to illegible data logs, um, reduced staff time for data entry, and in many cases, real-time updates. Um, what happened is inspectors realized that they could query this database, and in a lot of cases, they could see history of that watercraft that they were inspecting if it had previously been entered in the inspection station. Um, and so it was, it was a good tool for inspectors to possibly see that boat history. Um, also reporting functions built into the database allowed uh, managers in Colorado to more easily see trends within the state. Um, so this database was revamped and rebuilt by a contractor in 2012. Um, there's a, um, uh, sorry, an Apple and an Android application, both mobile and a website interface for the applications. Um, and then, so what started as um, a communication tool in Colorado um, across jurisdictions in Colorado, it, it developed into something that the rest of the region and other states realized that we could use this as a larger tool for communicating history of watercraft that moves across state boundaries or into different jurisdictions. Um, so other Western states and entities started using this application in 2014. Um, and as I mentioned, it's compatible with Apple and Android devices. Um, this is a screenshot of the mobile application. So this is what most inspectors on the ground are using that are actually going through inspection and decontamination. Um, you can view inspections and decontamination information. Um, something that was developed a little bit later is watercraft movement notification forms. So um, when a boat is leaving an infested water body, uh, the inspector can issue a movement notice that will notify all the travel route states and the destination state that this watercraft or conveyance is leaving an infested water body um, and then allows those agencies to follow up with that watercraft or conveyance as necessary. So currently, as of 2018, most Western states are using this database to share information. Um, there's some other partners as well. And additionally, um, this past year, Robert Walters with Colorado Parks and Wildlife has developed an online utility for um, displaying shared boat information that is um, coming from the data that is collected by the entities that are putting this inspection and decontamination information into the database. So it's a really great tool to really visually represent um, where these shared boat occurrences are and for managers to look at that and identify potential gaps and see um, these trends in boater movement. So this um, snapshot up there is actually Lake Powell. Um, so you can see that boaters come from all over to go boat at Lake Powell, which is you know, a very heavily used infested reservoir. Um, and you can even, uh, to some extent, see the density. So those red lines indicate that there's a higher density of boats coming from those locations. Um, can be used as a risk assessment tool by managers, so they can query the water body that they're interested in seeing, you know, patterns and decide um, if there's a gap there, prevention or containment. Um, so this is a really, really cool utility that's recently been developed. Um, 
it does have limitations, um, but and also opportunities. Um, it is not a tracking device. I just would like to say that people like to use the word tracking here. We don't have GPS devices on boats. We're not, we're not following boats um, everywhere they go. Um, the information is only as good as the data is being collected, where it's being collected, and by what agencies. Um, there is some user error. Um, the more users the application has, though, the the better and the more robust the data is and the more we can see trends and be able to uh, make management decisions using this database. Um, some, some more opportunities is it's very customizable um, both to the data that an agency wants to collect or the reports you want to run to get information out of the database. Um, the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency uh, developed a scanning application that just allows um, them to scan a sticker, for example, that would just populate that information into the database quicker than manually entering it. So there's a lot of developments that can be done that would enhance this. Um, oftentimes it's just a matter of time and money sometimes to get all the things that all the managers that are using this want to see out of the database, um, which is really cool. So there's there's a lot of applications. There's quality control applications that can be used. Um, it's free, thankfully. Colorado Parks and Wildlife has allowed us all to use it um, just because there are so many opportunities. So. In closing, this is just a, a tool that, that we as a region um, are using, and it really um, has been pretty game-changing in communicating, um, especially you know from my state when I can communicate if I know an infested watercraft or decontaminated boat is, is leaving my state and headed to uh, an uninfested water body. And so, um, it, and it also allows us to um, create some visually compelling graphics and really tell a story because we can talk about trends and watercraft movement all day, but when we can put up a map that really shows those pathways um, and that movement from different locations, it's really powerful. So um, special thanks to Robert Walters for um, at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. He provided me a lot of these graphics and these slides. Um, for more specific information, for the database, he really is the guy to go to um, since he, he manages that. Um, but yeah, I'll look forward to taking questions. Great, thank you, Erin. Uh, our last panelist is Christy Martin with the University of Hawaii, PCSU Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species. Christy. Thank you, um, aloha. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to just send out a very special mahalo Thank you to Gary Adams for coming to Hawaii and assisting us with um, training us, so many of us on incident management. And I have something for you, Gary. Something for you. I can deliver to you or you can come and get it. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not a bribe. <laughs> There's a little bit of um, ka'u coffee in there for you and a calendar with fish pictures, not coconut trees because I'm pretty sure you're Tired of thinking about palm trees in Hawaii. And I know you didn't get to go snorkeling, so. Hawaiians are always the best about bringing gifts wherever they go, and I need to learn a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo. All right. <laughs> All right, I'm going to take a left turn from terrestrial and freshwater issues and turn into the ocean and talk about uh, biofouling. And um, some pictures on my opening slide. Uh, the, the picture underwater is a fouled vessel. It is all of the stuff that grows on the outside. Of course, those are all living species that can get transported from one place to another. The map on the other side, yes, Erin, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is a vessel tracking map for 2017. That's how connected we are. So that's how much we share with every part of the world, all these species that are moving back and forth through this uh, vector. So biofouling, I'll, I'll give you a definition. Um, it's the growth of marine species on the wetted, the wet surfaces of vessels. And these can include just the plain hull of a vessel, but it can also be some of those intake areas, the niche areas between the rudder and where it connects to the ship, uh, around the propeller area, some of those intake pipes that go to cooling some of the parts of the vessel. All of those can become 
fouled. And despite anti-fouling paint and coatings, uh, microfouling uh, starts happening almost immediately within a, a couple of days of that vessel getting put back into the water. So microfouling is just the tiny organisms that begin forming essentially the slime layer on the outside of the vessel. And that forms a protective layer that can take that uh, vessel to the next stage, the second stage, and that's um, where larger species can settle. So microfouling, when you look at it, when you scrape a little bit of that off and you take a look under the microscope, those are really the diatoms. Those are the, the, the very tiny organisms. That's a very low biosecurity risk. However, when you leave that layer on the vessel, it allows larger species, the macrofouling, to be able to settle out. And that is a high biosecurity risk. It is also um, uh, uh, the main reason that ships can become less efficient. So if you imagine all of this growing on the outside of a vessel, it produces a lot of drag and that uses a lot of fuel. So uh, um, you may have noticed the title of my slide was the triple bottom line. We're trying to address this issue for <coughs> economic reasons, for biosecurity reasons, as well as for economic reasons. So. You know, when you have this macrofouling and microfouling on a vessel, um, from our perspective, working in the invasive species community, that's what we're trying to address. Um, when you let species uh, foul on a vessel to the level where it's, it's thick and there's a lot of species on it, the macrofouling layer, you could clean it off. Um, normally, what vessels would have to do is haul out of the water to clean that off. Um, vessels can't do that very frequently. Economically, they can do it maybe once every five years. And of course, you know that there's gonna be a lot of stuff on it before then. You can possibly clean it off in the water, but you're releasing not just the fouling species, um, and, and folks that have worked with invertebrates before, uh, a lot of these marine species, when they get agitated, or when they move to a different temperature, or perhaps a different salinity, the immediate response is, I gotta spawn now. And so um, they put out their propagules in the water and perhaps you have a new problem. Uh, so those species can escape. Um, it also can damage the paint or the coating on a vessel when you try and scrape it off. So there's lots of issues with dealing with this. So we did a lot of studies in Hawaii in partnership with a lot of uh, organizations. One in particular was a report that was done by the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. I've pulled out a few pieces of information that that consolidated. Um, first of all, we have a lot of non-native marine uh, and estuarine species. We have about 417 that we know of, uh, and this is data from maybe 10 years ago or so. Continental US has perhaps a few more. Um, and when you look at the composition of the species that are just the invertebrates and just the algal species, 70, up to 78% of those uh, 346 species arrived probably by vessel biofouling. So what's our bigger vector? Is it ballast water or is it biofouling? Clearly the numbers uh, show it is probably biofouling. Um, so it is um, largely unregulated. So um, when you look at how the cleaning of vessels in water occurs, it is under the purview actually of the EPA through the Clean Water Act. And it's done under the vessel general permit. So some states allow it and some states don't. Um, one thing to know that is that it's about to be probably deregulated with the passage of um, the Coast Guard Authorization Act uh, just today. There was a section that was amended into it that um, will mean that we'll have to all address biofouling and I'm so glad we get to talk about it together. So um, that's the glass half full. Uh, when you look at the native ranges of these species that we have uh, in Hawaii, they're global. So we know that connectivity, it doesn't really matter where that vessel is leaving from. Uh, it, can, it can end up anywhere. So the question arises, how do we help vessels address biofouling between dry dock and repainting years? There's relatively new technology out there that can clean hulls while they're in the water. And the new part of that is that sometimes there's capture technology. And so I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So sometimes they can be uh, 
driven by a diver. Sometimes it's remotely operated, as you can see, the steering wheel on the bottom in the comfort of a lab. Uh, you can either groom the surface when it's microfouling, so that slime layer, just very lightly rubbing it and getting that slime layer off. That's a great way to go. There's also this new technology where you can have this unit go along the hull and get the larger species off. It suctions it onto a containment unit on, on land. And there's multiple stages for cleaning out all of the contaminates in that water. And out the other end, you can have clean water coming out, clean ocean water. So that's great. Um, it's nice that these technologies exist. Um, they're largely not permitted to you to use in most parts of the US. So how do we assess this technology and show um, what it's capable of doing? And that's where our partners come in, the Alliance for Coastal Technology, or ACT. Uh, we are conducting third-party testing of these technologies to provide the data on the water quality and invasive species questions that would arise. So a little bit about um, them. We invited ourselves to their party. Uh, so <laughs> this is what largely their work, um, Alliance for Coastal Technologies and the Maritime Environmental Research Center. In collaboration with all of these partners, they conducted an in-water field test on a, a maritime administration vessel in Baltimore this year, summer. They then, uh, we, I participated in this one, uh, conducted a field test in Alameda just two weeks ago. And we are going to do that assessment of all of the data that was collected off of these samples. And we'll be able to put forth a peer reviewed publication. So this is a few pictures from that technology testing. This is the um, cleaning unit, the, the capture technology, the water cleaning station on land. Normally this is on a barge. Um, I can't show you the picture of the cleaning head, that's proprietary, but this is the water cleaning unit. I'm standing on top of that container and looking down and each stage the water gets cleaner and cleaner. Uh, on the side there's a large wheel, it's, it's got basically what's a large roll of millipore filter uh, on it and it cleans out the micro um, particles in it. The testing was pretty, um, there was a lot of QAQC. We had a, a, someone on QAQC the entire time um, monitoring our, our protocols. And you can see our clean hand, dirty hand uh, protocol for taking those water samples. We had a lot of replicates as well. So in summary, um, I'm glad that this testing is going on because uh, very clearly we're gonna need to work together to put in place um, some proposed um, uh, ways that we can use this technology in the future. We need to address biofouling. Um, we're not nearly as far along with that as we are with so many other vectors uh, and other species that we work on. So um, this is the slide thanking everybody involved in this project. So, mahalo. Great, thank you, Christine. Okay, a first question to our panelists here. Does vector management get enough attention in the fight against invas invasive species in the West, or do land man or managers tend to pay more attention to species once they arrive? Well, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, I think it's increasingly being paid attention to at a level that um, is better and better all the time. It's really hard to sell proactive, preventative measures, especially for something that's more um, abstract for pathway management as opposed to a scary bug or a scary something or other. Um, but I think policymakers and agencies and the various different groups that have the power to regulate pathways appropriately are, are increasingly seeing the wisdom of a more comprehensive approach. Well, I guess I'll answer for um, all of the ocean people out there. <laughs> um, ours is a largely hidden issue, and uh, we constantly find ourselves trying to um, raise awareness, even within our own community, uh, as well as with our, um, all of our decision makers, that ocean issues and invasive species that are vectored by uh, vessels as well as uh, other industry operations. 
needs to be addressed. So I, I would say we're very happy to be here. We're very happy to have some attention. Um, and, uh, and I think it's getting better as well. Um, I also think that um, as managers and agencies, we, as, as Lee was saying, we are starting to recognize the pathways more in part because um, there's, there's more than one species and a lot of times one pathway can address multiple species. So we're really focused on the quagga and zebra mussels um, for inland aquatic invasive species, but there's, there's hydrilla, you know, was brought up today and all sorts of plants and snails and, and other species of concern um, that can be addressed if we address the pathway. And so it's a much more holistic approach to start thinking about the vectors and the pathways rather than the individual species. Great. All right, again, to all of the panelists here, what are some of the largest cross-boundary obstacles to preventing transportation of invasive species, and how can those obstacles be alleviated? Well, I know with, with firewood, which um, is a particularly tricky one, one of the biggest issues is that the agencies that really could help often don't have the correct jurisdiction or regulatory authority to regulate firewood as itself, firewood as a thing, the commodity itself. They instead have the ability to regulate based on its pest risk, which then sort of turns the pathway on its head. You're not actually regulating by the pathway, then you're regulating pest by pest of a commodity. So that legal and regulatory framework complexity really complicates the conversation and the management of the pathway as a whole. Yeah, I would say for, um, for marine aquatic invasive species issues, I'd say that there's, um, it, it's been a real challenge developing the technology to address uh, these invasive species issues in ballast water as well as on the hulls of vessels. So I think that that was really our big challenge. Uh, on the plus side, though, particularly for the issue of biofouling, our desire to be more fuel efficient and um, sustainable means that that's going to really help drive this technology. Uh, one of the challenges, though, I mean, it's a plus minus plus thing. Um, so one of the challenges is that this technology so far has largely addressed just the flat surfaces and not so much the niche areas. So we'll still have a bit of work to do after that. but. It's one of the areas where, um, thank heavens, it, it, it's almost driving itself with fuel econ economy. Um, for Arizona, we have several very large water bodies that cross multiple state boundaries. They have um, federal authorities, different federal managing agencies, local, state. <coughs> again, federal agencies, and there's just a lot of stakeholders. Um, in, the, in parts of the lower Colorado, there's a lot of checkered private land ownership. And um, so that's, um, even in, in my state, um, one of the big cross-boundary challenges that there's different authorities amongst all of the stakeholders um, that have jurisdiction or authority. Um, when you're talking about different states, different states have different authorities. Um, that's something that you know, as a region, we've really tried to work on, you know, Elizabeth's mentioned the Western Regional Panel earlier today and a lot of the work that's gone on there with building consensus and one of the things is trying to get our laws and regulations um, as close to, um, as close to each other as they can be, you know, we'll never have identical authorities, but um, my, my state in particular, just there, there are a lot of different players on very big water bodies that are infested and there's a lot of access um, that is very difficult to manage. So I think, um, speaking from my state strictly, that's probably our biggest challenge cross-boundary wise. Great. Um, all right, maybe some specific questions here. So um, to Lee, some plant pests, such as the emerald ash borer, are extremely dispersed and can be transported in a variety of ways. Um, how would you go about approaching managing this challenge that is so broad? Thanks, Leah. So, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that the Nature Conservancy really prides itself on is a scientific approach to problems. And with the emerald ash borer especially, 
Um, the program has evolved with the science behind it, so the different pathways have risk analysis and the different biologies of the different pests. In this case, we're talking about emerald ash borer, but each, each pest has a different biology. And to take those pathways and the, that biological information and to put them into a targeted approach, so we target things like firewood, which is particularly high risk, and then we target making sure that the um, nursery and sapling industry uh, works really well with the regulations to prevent the unintentional movement on infested saplings. You know, you have to break the problem up into these highest, highest risk and greatest impact targets in order to address each one of them separately. If you looked at the whole picture, you would get overwhelmed very quickly, but if you just look at the pieces that, you know, science and policy can address, then actually it becomes quite, quite manageable in those slices of the picture. I mean, emerald ash borer is really hard because it forms these mosaics of infestation in the states. Um, it's cryptic at first because it likes to attack the top of the tree when it begins an infestation. Um, so it's really tough. So you really have to hit these high-risk pathways without necessarily precise regard for exactly where the pest is or exactly what you know is going on. Great, thanks. Um, to Erin, so every day there are many watercraft leaving infested water bodies in Arizona. Um, you did just previously allude to you know, that challenge, but how do you tackle that challenge of um, those, each of those boats being a potential vector and what tools do you need to track them better? Or even maybe it's to manage that vector better. Yeah, so um, Arizona does not have inspection and decontamination stations, and that would be the biggest first step that we could take. Um, there are um, a couple of barriers that we are continuing to try and work through, um, one of them being that um, as, as a state agency right now, I cannot hire people. Um, there's a hiring freeze. Um, there's a cap on each state agency. Um, federal agencies have difficulty hiring seasonal folks. Um, it's really hard to find private industry that wants to do this work, especially in Arizona. It's really hot. Um, the work is very difficult. Um, when you're talking decontaminating an infested watercraft, that can sometimes take days. It's very dirty, very labor-intensive work. Um, so that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to work through. I mentioned um, you know, the, the highly multi-jurisdictional nature of a lot of our infested water bodies. Um, it is something that we are working through um, with our partners um, to try and really uh, leverage our resources where we can. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really great talk today about partnerships and building those and leveraging resources. And so there's been a lot of really creative conversations um, in the past year with my partners on, on how we can work through these issues and if the Park Service can take on this aspect and then Arizona can fill in this role and then Utah can pick up this slack. Um, so we really are having to think outside of the box in a lot of cases and really, um, really collaborate, which is really the best way to, to manage invasive species anyways, because as many people have said, they don't recognize political boundaries. Um, another barrier that we're facing is um, my state's interpretation of inspections right now is that it is a search and seizure. Um, so having law enforcement presence at an inspection station at all hours of operation is cost prohibitive. Um, and we also have a shortage of wildlife managers at my agency. So we just have a shortage of law enforcement anyways. Um, so that is another challenge that we are having to look at and figure out how can we, how can we overcome this particular challenge. Um, fortunately, we do have a really good working relationship with our other um, states, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, that database is only as good as the data being collected. So there's not a ton of data coming out of Arizona. We, we decontaminate long-term moored infested boats as they become known to us. <laughs> um, but um, so in, in my graphic earlier where you could see all that movement of boats from Powell, um, Powell is doing inspections and they are recording presence, but um, 
a lot of that data is coming from my, my partner states that are intercepting boats from Arizona or recording inspections of boats coming from Arizona. And so that kind of right now is helping fill in some of that information that is lacking from the Arizona side. Um, so that's, that's really important and we really appreciate um, getting a lot of that information from our state or our other state partners or our entities and being able to see those gaps that are we're missing in our own data recording. Great, thanks Aaron. Uh, all right, to Christy, um, managing biofouling is an expensive and challenging prospect. Uh, are there any emerging technologies or policies that could help, um, I guess, help alleviate some of that challenge or those challenges? Yeah, I, um, yeah, it is expensive. <laughs> this is challenging. Uh, I think in water cleaning is definitely one of those things that um, we can all really embrace. It's a great technology that's out there. Um, there's a number of companies that are operating around the world. They each have their, um, their specialties. And the more we look to trying to figure out how to assist these companies in, through the regulatory pathway to be able to operate in our waters, I think the better off we'll all be because uh, obviously the connectivity between all of our states is pretty high. Um, so I, I think that's one area that, um, that's really positive. Uh, I know that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we definitely have to start looking towards this. Um, it looks like uh, we're going to probably have to come up with a national standard for addressing um, in-water cleaning. And so, um, yeah, there's the opportunity. Um, so we'll, we'll see what we can do in this next two years together. Great, thanks, Christy. So I think at this point we can see if there are any questions from the audience related to vector management. Samantha? <laughs> Good afternoon, Samantha Simon with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Thank you all for your comments. Um, my question is for Lee, actually. Um, could you, we've heard a lot of talk today about the importance of um, communication and uh, uh, that communication message. Can you talk about some of the out, outreach work that the Nature Conservancy is doing um, to talk, to bring awareness to the critical pathways and the effectiveness of that work? Sure, that's a great question. That's a great question because we work with so many partners in this room on our outreach and I think it's a real testament um, to the spirit of cooperation on how outreach works. So I'll take Don't Move Firewood as the example, but there's actually lots of other important campaigns in the sphere of um, pathway outreach. And the, um, the messages that we've developed for Don't Move Firewood through the years are action-based. So even though I call it Don't Move Firewood, which is a bit of a bad habit, we actually have lots of behavior change messages that we headline our posters with because we don't want people to take away the impression that we're being negative. And so we work a lot with campaigns that are named Buy It Where You Burn It um, that mention the importance of buying certified heat-treated firewood where, it's where it is available, which is largely not in the Western United States. Um, and we work with partners to make sure that those messages are, um, as they say, harmonized, so fairly identical or as close to it as possible throughout all the different states and uh, so that the public hears them repeatedly, which means they really internalize them and they actually learn to do that positive behavior, that buy it where you burn it behavior, or uh, the Play Clean Go campaign, which is one of our partner campaigns that we work with to make sure that we're being effective throughout lots of different types of invasive species. They have lots of positive uh, messages as well that they include us on. When you work across the different boundaries within um, the sphere of invasive species, so state, federal, tribal, you know, you name it, um, you can get your message so much farther and be so much more effective and we do have some really good research to show that when you do expose people to these messages repeatedly, they change their behavior. We know that, for instance, in the heavily messaged areas, such as Wisconsin, in areas where they, you know, promote buy it where you burn it heavily, people report, you know, a drop from like 30% people knowing that they should be buying firewood near where they burn it to 90% of people knowing that they should 
burn firewood near where they burn it. You know, it's, it's pretty stark over the course of a timeline. We use social science research to get those numbers to make sure that they're valid. Um, so it's a really an important cooperative effort throughout North America, and you know the Western states are very good about this. I think that's a kudos to everyone in this room for cooperating on outreach messaging on invasive species to the extent that they do. Any other questions from the audience? I kind of been waiting for nobody else to ask a question because I'm asking so many, but uh, as you guys are going through this, I, I keep thinking about how we filter all this through our wealthy American eyes and, and particularly with something that's international like biofouling. I guess the question I have, and maybe it's for each of you because we have, we have more or less affluent portions of our country too. How do you message this? How do you set in place like best management practices and then get people to practice them when you know they're barely able to feed themselves uh, you know how do you is there an international organization that addresses this how do how do you how do you get to the point where you have ecologically sound practices occurring for places where people don't have the same kind of filter we do as our american society Well, I'll start off briefly. Um, for biofouling, yes, there's a whole number of places, um, small Pacific islands, for example, that would never be able to uh, support such a, a, a thing. Um, one thing that the community is doing is, um, for example, the, the nations that can should, uh, and it should be a service that's available for the vessels that are coming in. Um, and that's how we protect our neighbors and protect the, our ability to move vessels uh, internationally. And you know, when you look at it from a regulatory perspective, that's the International Maritime Organization. Uh, they have a um, they have rules for bio sorry ballast water that just came into force. Uh, they don't have one for <coughs> biofouling, and I understand that that is going to be the next step. Uh, but figuring out the back end, you know, how can we help vessels do this? Um, that's where we have to catch up for, sorry, for all vessels to rise uh, on that tide. So you're right, we need to help out um, the small places that can't do it um, by being the ones to be able to be that service provider. With regards to forest pests and pathogens, um, there's, there's two places that we work pretty hard on equity in terms of response and, and invasive species. One example is the heat treatment standards of pallets are held by international treaty. It levels the playing field. So some countries are, are so if you're going to export a pallet out of your country of origin to an, a new place, so into the United States, you have the same rules no matter what country you're in and no matter what direction you're going. And at least then it's, it's even. Um, so that's much better than only rich companies or rich countries being able to export to other countries. You know, it's a, it's a playing field that at least we can level out. With firewood, the buy it where you burn it message is often not palatable in the lower socioeconomic strata, especially in the home heating realm. That's entirely unreasonable to tell somebody who's already struggling economically to heat their um, home with purchased firewood. So we do complement all of our materials in areas where we are focusing on home heating with a harvest it near your home or make sure you're paying attention to the best management practices. Uh, a great example of that is the Gallatin National Forest had a problem with uh, mountain pine beetle infested pine, which is not an invasive, it's native, but it's a similar system and it was coming out of the Gallatin and infesting potentially neighborhood trees near where people were harvesting firewood and then burning it to heat their home. So they put out some really great best management statements about wait until the needles fall off the tree because typically speaking that lowers the pest risk of that firewood after you harvest it. So those sorts of simple things to make sure people can heat their home are really important to outreach campaigns. Um, I'm struggling with this one a little bit, um, but I think there is, a, for, for freshwater inland, there is also a very important tie-in with um, biofouling that we often don't think about. Um, 
so so a lot of Christie's points would would um, apply for us as freshwater because there are quite a few freshwater species invasive that have been brought inland that were initially introduced um, from from biofouling and coastal waters and then made their way inland. Quagga and zebra mussels are a perfect example. Um, so whatever can be done on the biofouling you know, side would also protect, um, in many cases, um, from, from some of those becoming established in water and, and freshwater ecosystems. Um, recreational boating's tricky. Um, there are a lot of affluent people that own really nice watercraft, and there is um, um, a bit of a, a debate, or maybe just, maybe not a debate, but um, we're not all aligned in, do we have the boaters pay for the cost of inspection and decontamination programs? Um, they are the ones moving these species around largely, um, and it has impacts for everybody um, if these species get introduced. Um, so that's why a lot of programs have enacted AIS fees and stamps. Um, in Arizona, um, at this point in time, I'm pretty firmly in the um, category of I want to provide free or at least subsidized decontaminations of infested boats for as long as we can um, because we've just seen, um, unfortunately, that um, people, even if they have the money, and, and it's not to say every boater has a lot of money or is affluent, you know, but um, we've just seen time and time again, unfortunately, that people will skip out on an inspection and a decon, especially if they have to pay for it. Um, so it's, it's really hard. I understand the, um, the thought process behind um, it should be a boater's responsibility and a cost of boating, just like you have to keep your vehicle, you know, in working order and, and safe to be on a roadway. Um, it should be that same way with recreational boating, but, but that's not what we're seeing. So um, from my perspective, I just want to take care of as many boats as possible. And if we have to offer for your subsidized decontamination, and, and right now we're kind of going out of our way um, to make appointments and do these decontaminations, um, because that does protect everybody else. There we go. Great work, all of you. Um, Christy, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with saying that the uh, Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, I sit on that, and there's a lot of dialogue between the American Boat and Yacht Council and the National Marine Manufacturers Association. What kind of, and about the design of boats and the nooks and crannies and prevention and, and even to some technologies about, um, you know, microcurrents, you know, things that can be, you know, keep things from wanting to attach. Any dialogue at the big container ship level that you've heard of or organizations that might be involved with some of the new designs that are coming out? I've seen some, you know, when we were in Savannah, Georgia a year or so ago for the North American Forum, uh, we saw the largest container ship in the world come into the port of Savannah. Um, fantastic sized. And, um, and I think that port was one of the few that can handle it. But what a huge surface, plus the nooks and crannies. Any talk about that at that bigger level? Yeah, I would say probably the most excitement um, is not so much around the shape of ships. Of course, that's going to help with um, uh, with the issue, but it, it really is more around the coatings of vessels. So as a baker, <laughs> we use all of these silicone cups now and these all of these things because everything just slides right out. Um, well, a lot of the new hull coatings are really designed around that technology where things can slough off uh, when you're going at certain speeds. Um, that doesn't help so much when your vessel is slower, for example. Um, species grow at different rates and different temperatures. You're always going to have some of the areas of the vessel that are more protected, and so you're always going to have this issue in some way or another. Uh, I guess I would say also with ships becoming larger and larger, the ability to pull those out of the water and dry dock them is becoming, <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, so I, I would say we've got a lot of um, room for new technologies 
um, ship shape is going to be just one small part of the puzzle. Yep. Great. I think we have time for one more question. No? I did want oh. to. Oh, go ahead, Lee. I, I was going to comment on the economic thing one more time because it is quite fascinating. Uh, so, in order to best address the firewood issue, one of the things that we've been working on is the economic motivation or not to bring firewood from home, which is, you know, it's what motivates people. And using really solid information helps inform the approach. And the two funny anecdotes that I have is that the New Hampshire Department of Agriculture did a massive survey of folks in New Hampshire. And the reason that people bring firewood from home and move it to a new location in New Hampshire is because their firewood's better. <laughs> and then in Oregon, they did, uh, there was a graduate student who similarly did a really great study, interviewed tens of people, tried to figure out why people were moving firewood in Oregon. And in Oregon, it was largely just because they wanted to make sure there was dry firewood when they got there. It rains a lot in Oregon. Uh, so the motivation there is totally different. You could imagine different approaches in terms of your messages. Um, and neither of those was economic. We, th we thought it was because they were worried about spending five bucks. It, it's not in that case. Sometimes it is. Not in that case. Oh, okay. Well, you can ask your question. Go ahead, Bill. Sure. This is uh, this is Bill from WGA, Bill Whitaker from Western Governors, and I just had a question. I went to a meeting for the um, North American Invasive Species Management Association last year, and they had a presentation from a public relations expert who was talking about sort of the science of getting the public aware on vector issues. And it's uh, it was a little disheartening is that it's not enough to talk about don't burn it where you buy it once. You have to tell people 12 times a year for the rest of time um, for them to remember to do that. And I'm just wondering if you do, you, so you've got that with um, firewood, you've got that with boats, you've got that with biofouling. At what point is there sort of fatigue on this messaging? And have there been any attempts to sort of wrap all of this up into one sort of holistic communication on invasive species? Or is it better to just do it sort of piecemeal, one species at a time? So um, I come from it from a communication standpoint uh, from my work. Uh, social science actually says um, you don't just have to repeat it so many times, but you actually have to hook them through their heart. And so no matter how many times you say something, if you don't have their heart first, you don't have them at all. Um, so I would suggest that what we have to do is figure out, um, find them where they live, meet them in that space, figure out the messaging that's going to work for them, um, so you have to know their rationale for doing what they do, and you know research is the only way to go. Uh, and then assess your messaging based on that. If you don't do those first steps, um, you're wasting money. We um, we have the "Don't Move a Muscle" campaign in Arizona for many years, and billboards everywhere. I mean, when we as an agency had really no money, really to implement a program. It was, it was education and that don't move a muscle was a big component of that. Um, just before I came into my role in May of last year, um, the agency did um, a little focus group and some surveys with the public on that messaging and they found largely that most people had heard or seen don't move a muscle and they could tell you what a muscle was, but beyond that, how it impacted them, if, if and how it was carried on their boats. I mean, there was a big disconnect between the tagline <laughs> and the actual understanding or maybe the heart string piece of it. So we found that we were really kind of missing the mark there and um, did a, a rebrand. But we're, um, so, so we're trying to move not just from a muscle perspective, since we have so many infested waters, but to more of an all taxa AIS perspective in the state of Arizona to say, okay, not all of our waters have quagga mussels, but there's also so many other things that could be introduced and compound the problem. So um, we, we've looked at that a little bit. I don't know if it was fatigue in the messaging exactly, um, or, if it, or if it was just a disconnect between um, the slogan and the educational or heartstring part. Yeah, and from the terrestrial standpoint, um, there's a number of different campaigns that work together. So the three that um, I work with most closely, I manage the Don't Move Firewood campaign. 
Then there's the Play Clean Go campaign, which is managed by the group you just mentioned, uh, NASMA. Uh, and then also there's the Hungry Pests campaign, which is managed by USDA APHIS. And the three managers frequently interact to make sure that we aren't duplicating effort, that we are staying within our core messages and we're not accidentally counter, uh, excuse me, um, sort of stepping on each other's toes either in terms of messaging space or best practices or, or anything. As a result of that, we're able to get our messages out more efficiently and more effectively and in more places. Like I mentioned, the pathway of recreational boaters and RVs is very worrisome to me from a firewood perspective. So I work with the folks doing the AIS work so that our messages get out in a consistent and non-overlapping way. And you know that it's a, it's an aquatic metaphor, but that raises all boats. Great. Well, we have made it to the end of this panel. So can you please join me in thanking?